Hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, happy that you can join us this Sunday for our program, uh, Church of the Eternally Secure. And um, we have uh, with us, as usual, Sister Renee and Brother Matthias, Brother Daniel. I expect Brother Bill will probably be joining us pretty soon. I haven't heard anything about our Brother Honore yet, so uh, I'm not sure of his status, if he's available today or not. But I'm real anxious to uh, get started. Uh, let me ask everybody just take a moment and introduce yourselves and your channel for any of those people who may be here for the first time and, and don't know us. And let's start with Sister Renee. Yeah, you gotta unmute. It's all right, you can barely hear me anyway. Uh, I have a little bit of bronchitis, please forgive me. My channel is Renee Roland, uh, R-O-L-A-N-D. And it is to stand firm on the clarity of the gospel, to get saved, unsaved people saved, um, to get saved people secure, and, and to get confused people out of uh, confusing doctrine and resting in the eternal security we have in Christ. Uh, so many seem to think they can lose salvation, but that's only true if your salvation is based on what you do instead of what was done 2,000 years ago. So that's the entire uh, purpose of my channel. Thanks. Uh, I will add that uh, when she says that's the entire purpose of her channel, I, uh, Sister Renee focuses like a laser beam on, on the gospel and salvation. She truly is an evangelist. Uh, as someone who wants to share the good news about Jesus and his free gift of salvation. Um, I'm glad that uh, she's also uh, willing to discuss other topics with us too, but really her passion is the gospel. And uh, next we have uh, Brother Matthias, Brother Daniel. Hey guys, uh, our channel is Talking Doctrine. Uh, on the channel, we've got Bible studies on Tuesdays and Thursday. Then Saturday night, we have panel discussions. But really, any other night other than those three, if anybody wants to pick a subject, a topic that they want to talk about and sharpen swords over, email us uh, at talkingdoctrine at gmail.com, and we'll set up a time to where we can just talk it out with you guys as well. So. Um, it's really just a channel to get everybody involved. The chat room is active and we always bring the chat room into the conversation. So, you know, it's a channel where we want to talk and we want to talk doctrine. So join us. It's me, Matthias, Daniel here. And, uh, then Nori, uh, is, makes it when he can. So, um, uh, Lord willing, he'll be able to make it maybe later today, but if not, you can see him on talking doctrine. So. Welcome, everybody, or thank you, guys. All right, and then did Brother uh, Daniel want to say hi? Hi, how's it going? I'm Daniel. <laughs> okay, very good. Uh, yeah, what they're doing on Talking Doctrine is a lot of fun and very interesting. Uh, like Sister Renee, uh, she dares to uh, address any problem verse. Uh, I really admire that about her. And with talk and doctrine, they, they dare to address any theological topic. And when you do these things, you're really running a great risk because whenever you discuss any theological topic, uh, uh, many subjects, uh, the, the opinions are divided. And when you do take it aside, you say, this is my opinion, then you, you run a risk of, maybe half or more of, of the, the, the congregation uh, being upset about it because there is so little tolerance for other opinions. And that's, that's one of the main things that we are trying to not only promote and teach, but also demonstrate every Sunday that we can disagree uh, and still um, uh, discuss our, uh, the topic with respect and, and, and love for each other without resorting to getting upset and emotional and name calling or uh, accusations and finger pointing. That it, kind of thing is, it's far too common. And I'm sick of it. 
and I'm sure a lot of other people have gotten sick of it. So we want to have unity in the essential doctrines of Christianity. We want to have liberty in all the non-essentials, and that's what we're going to be talking a lot more about today, these non-essentials. And then, uh, uh, but in all our conversations uh, among the, the church members and even uh, among the, the, the world itself, we want to conduct ourselves and, and uh, in a way that Jesus would be happy with our conduct and that uh, everybody can see the, the love of Christ in us. Um, all right, so enough for the introductions. Uh, I don't have any announcements to make. Uh, um, Brother Matthias, any announcements? I've noticed that the website is uh, working much better. Uh, any uh, update on the website? or Does anybody have an announcement? Um, on the website, uh, I, yeah, praise God that it's working a lot better. Um, we changed some things around to uh, uh, add room for growth because uh, there's a bunch of ideas that we were, that we're going to implement to the website. Um, and so, you know, just uh, go in there and check around. We've got uh, um, yeah, an announcements page now, so we'll try to keep up on announcements there. There's a place where you can actually ask questions. So if you go into the Sunday broadcast, you can either go under the Sunday broadcast page. From there, you can either choose the library or to ask a question for the panel here. So for the weekly uh, broadcasts, uh, just if you're in conversation, fellowshipping there, and uh, you decide you want to ask a question for the Sunday broadcast, you can just click right over there. There's actually a page there now for you to do it. And really, it's set up to where, um, with all the chat rooms together, you can choose the chat room, go directly to it, and just post. Um, uh, we've got some more uh, things coming. Um, if you guys know any of uh, recommended YouTube channels that we sh that we should uh, promote here, please email them to to us. Uh, and uh, as we build more ideas, um, uh, one of the things we're working on now is materials and information to help people to start their own little home church gathering. Uh, and then a place to where people can actually uh, find one another. So we've got a bunch of people in Texas, so hopefully there'll be, uh, be a couple of them there at least. Because uh, in our chat room yesterday alone, there was like 10 people from the around the DFW area. So, um, you know, if we put a little system together on our little house church here, uh, then hopefully we can promote people doing it uh, as well. So our our purpose is to just try to promote fellowship and to bring the brethren, brethren closer together. So yeah, check out the site house, the number two, housechurch.com if you're not a member already okay all right very good um uh, all right um if, there, if there's no more announcements uh the next part of our program is uh taking some time to pray pray for uh, all, each other's needs uh i didn't have anybody send me directly any prayer requests this week as we have had in the past uh so i went to the the website and I looked at the prayer requests and copied them and uh, so I'll, I'm going to read them off now. Uh, these are people who posted their uh, prayer needs uh, on the website and so I'm sure that people are already praying for these needs but now with this uh, this audience here let's let's join in uh, praying for these uh, um, all, all these people's needs. Uh, the first one is from uh, but by the blood, uh, three days ago, they posted, can someone pray for me, please? I have an addiction that seems to have gripped me. I can't help but think God is angry with me now. There are quite a few posts on the website there to uh, try to address this uh, feeling that he thinks God is angry with him. Um, uh, another one is Ken. 
747 three days ago. He he asked, I need prayers for my household. We have a grandson with autism and he is worse some days than others. He needs prayer. Love you guys. His name is Logan. And then uh, the next one is uh, just one day ago, it was posted by R-I-S-J-C. Uh, hi, everyone. Just need prayer uh, as going through some things and transitions. Yesterday was the year anniversary of my dad's passing, and now his sister is on hospice, and my mom has been gone for 17 years. So emotions are triggered again. Migraines are getting worse this past week, and I'm juggling two part-time jobs, a new marriage and a new home with about 80% remodeling to go, a new town. I know this sounds like a lot on my plate, but I've really been blessed the past year. I just wanted to continue to find peace, continue to hear what God wants to do with my life and husband's. Uh, felt so many attacks over the years, even from friends and family and other professing Christians. Thank you much. Blessings to each of you, Amy. Um, and then uh, this is a prayer request for OSAS is the gospel, First uh, John 6, 4, 7. He says, please pray for my new YouTube channel that it won't be hacked by trolls. Yeah, yeah, we've we've had quite a bit of problem with that just recently. Um, well, those were the prayer requests that were posted on the website. Uh, I would ask everybody to continue praying for my niece, Linda. Uh, she, as I said, she's developed a heart condition and it could be very serious. So, uh, and uh, I'm going to again ask for prayers uh, for me. Um, I, I have to go back to the cardiologist again. And uh, uh, it's, I don't think it's serious, but uh, my heart rate is about half of what it's supposed to be. So I'm like, it seems like I'm running on fumes. I, I just can't get any energy. So, uh, and uh, uh, let's not forget to pray for Sister Renee who's with us today only because she's just so tough and determined uh, to participate. Uh, she's under the weather with a, a very a sore throat and a, and a fever, but, and yet she's still here. Uh, so those are the prayer needs. Uh, if someone has a need that what you want to mention that I didn't go ahead, sister. I have a long-term viewer and friend, Jennifer Petty. Her mother's been given three months to live. She's down to 64 pounds, and uh, we're praying for her salvation. She's been given so much false Christianity that she can't hear the truth. And uh, I'm praying more for Jennifer and her sister and for the family to have strength and healing and to come together around this um, so that they can have peace. Um through this time and also for the salvation of her mom. All right. All right. Thank you. Uh, Matthias or Daniel, anything you would need to add to this? If, if not, uh, go ahead. You have any, anything? Okay. All right. Uh, so those are the prayer needs, uh, the prayer requests that were given to us. So as a body, Let's all take 30 seconds now in silence and pray in your own way for these needs to be met.
All right. All right. Thank you all. And all who agree, say amen. Amen. All right. Uh, now for let's get uh, before we get into the questions and the uh, the discussion today, uh, we want to enjoy some music and Brother Daniel is going to handle that for us. So Brother Daniel. All right. A couple of um, the songs that I chose today is going to be Christ, the solid rock. I saw it in the, uh, in the group on the website, there was that one and then nothing but the blood. So I thought those would be a good <coughs> couple songs we could do today. So he's got the first one he's got up is, uh, on Christ, the solid rock. I stand. I haven't sang these probably in a while, so we're just going to wing it. I hope we got it. <laughs> is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other round is sinking sand When darkness veils his lovely face I rest on his unchanging grace and Every high and stormy gale My anchor holds within the veil On Christ the solid Rock I stand, all other round is sinking sand. All other round is sinking sand. His oath, his covenant and blood support me in the whelming flood. And every earthly prop is way. He then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, I will obey it. In his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. All right, and then nothing but the blood. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. I know 
nothing but the blood of Jesus for my cleansing this my plea nothing but the blood of Jesus oh precious is the flow that makes me white as appreciated that um maybe we ought to talk just for a moment here just about the hymns that we've we've been able to hear uh, thanks to brother daniel it's I, i've been impressed yeah. Yeah, go ahead yeah one thing i just wanted to mention when you just read these hymns you think about the christian music today and there's a time and place for praise and worship but you think just how much truth is in these older hymns and then like today, the praise and worship can just be singing the same phrase. I can feel your spirit like 20 times and they think that's really worship. But when you read things like this, just the, the nuggets of, and diamonds of truth in there is just so deep. Uh, I, I think it's just amazing that the hymns, the old hymns, they never get old. They're just so full of truth and so encouraging. Well, yeah. Uh, just to add to that, the one of the verses that we actually, for time's sake, didn't uh, didn't sing, but like now by this I'll overcome. I mean that's directly out of the Bible. How are we going to overcome? Who is he that overcometh? But he that believeth on on Jesus. Paraphrasing, but uh. uh no. Revelation and they overcome by the blood of the Lamb. You know, I think right. There's, saying. there's that, there's a bunch, but overcome is directly out of the Bible. And how are we going to do it? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Amen. So I, I love these old hymns. Saved, I was 29 and had never really heard hymns. You know, um, so went to assemblies and really singing these songs and and understanding what they meant as i was reading through the bible uh there's just something behind these old time hymns that uh really grabs onto the spirit and is able just to project forth uh his glory so i love them thank you sister renee yeah i find it ironic that churches will sing songs like blessed assurance and then go in the pulpit and tell you how you can lose your salvation or they'll tell you nothing but the blood nothing but the blood and then tell you, you got to repent of your sins do good works can't live any way you want submit your life be obedient to cry all this other nonsense that's your righteousness instead of the righteousness of god i think one of the hymns he talked about was that nothing but his righteousness i'll wear and since no scripture is of private interpretation, you know, uh, people send me things like only he that overcomes. Well, that's not your private interpretation. The Bible 
interprets itself. Who's he that overcomes? He that believes Jesus is the Son of God. How do we overcome? Even our faith. Or as he said, a revelation by the blood of the Lamb. You know, it's all what he did. And uh, there, my pastor got a newer hymnal, and he went through in black marker. Praise God. And he's a very godly man. I mean, he's he's very strict in his living, but he's very secure in the foundational truth of the gospel. And there's a song called Victory in Jesus, and it says, I repented of my sins and found the victory. I'm like, really? I had the power the whole time. All I had to do is just stop my sin. Who knew? You know, and we scratch that stuff out. Most of them are uh, the older ones really do glorify Christ and what he did. And I think we need to pay more attention to what these hymns are actually saying. Uh, like he said, it's a bunch of repetitious stuff. I mean, I guess that's fine, but it's like, Pour your spirit down on me. Oh, Jesus, how great is your name? Like for 10 minutes, you know, but these tell you about salvation and what he accomplished. And uh, I've been really impressed with uh, the songs Daniel's been singing for us. And I'm really grateful. Thanks, Daniel. You know, what, one thing I wanted to mention was, you know, why don't these people just really sing what they believe and just say like, you know, what can wash away my sin? nothing but lordship salvation or my water baptism you know it, it just is a contradiction to what these songs are singing they'll get up and sing them and just completely forget that and just go with what their preachers preach that's you know not the truth so wow that was that was a quite a surprise i you know i haven't known brother daniel that long and I've been impressed with his his knowledge, and, and he's very very sober, and it seems. And and now he just made me laugh out loud. Uh, so you've got a good sense of humor too. Thank you. But regarding the uh, uh, the, the hymns, um, uh, I I did a collaboration with uh, Jack Smack. Uh, I think we talked about four or five of the most popular uh, old hymns. And we went through them line by line, and just like teaching out of the Bible, we were we were teaching about the hymns. And uh, uh, I th I really think that uh, when they wrote those hymns, uh, they really had it right. And uh, the churches today, in America at least, uh, is is so wrong. Um, but um, I, you know, we we're all blessed that we we've got a Bible to refer to, but there's there's a lot of people uh and even in the world today that don't have a bible and the hymn the thing about a hymn that's nice is that if it's like this kind of a hymn is that um you can get a real clear explanation of the gospel and salvation um uh, from the hymn probably better than you're going to get from most pulpits in america uh and for those people who don't have a bible they, if they have a hymnal that might that might be uh uh, plenty for them. Um, all right. Uh, anything else on hymns before we go into the, uh, the subject today? All right, then. Uh, okay, we've had a lot of people um, uh, send us questions, and, and we've had questions uh, in the past talk asking us about this uh, unity, liberty, and charity concept. We've had questions about well, what are the, the these essentials that you unify around? And we've talked at great length uh, on those things. Uh, but now the question is, uh, well, what are your these uh, so-called non-essentials? And what is your position on these non-essentials? So uh, I thought, well, I could have tried to just make up my own list, but I think that between the the um, the four of us, we can just take turns bringing up a non-essential subject or question. And um, uh, what I want to do is I'll pose the, this, the, the subject in, in the form of a true and false. Um, and then everybody just say true or false, and we'll see our position on that non-essential. But uh, I think what we're going to learn from this, I predict in advance, is that uh, just as we've had in these programs over the last couple of months, you'll see that 
there is no unanimity there we are we're all all conforming to one person's view we're all we all have our own minds we all study we've all come to our own conclusions and we, when we disagree it can turn into an interesting discussion and we can learn from it but it doesn't turn into uh, a point of division where we're going to break fellowship over any of these things so that's the important thing to learn from this and i i made a video years ago titled test for dogmatists because i wanted to prove that uh, if you really were to analyze every um, non-essential topic and like we're doing today and take a position on it you'll find that you're not going to find any other individual in the world who's going to match your answers completely you're going to they're going to find some subject where wait i think that's true no that's false so the question is how do we deal with each other when this disagreement comes up we don't agree on it well our conclusion is it's not essential it's something to discuss and study together it's not essential we don't need to get angry and break fellowship over it uh, so uh, let me start off. I'll bring up the very first one. And this is kind of a timely one because a lot of people are talking about this right now. And that is, I'll pose it in the form of a question and ask anybody, everybody to answer. Now, we're not going to go in and really discuss the topic. Let's just, I want to just get through a lot of different non-essential topics just so we can see our answers. And then we can go back after we're finished with that and uh, discuss in detail any of them that you choose. Uh, but the first one will be, uh, the earth is flat, not spherical, true or false. And I'll start off by saying, uh, I'd say it's true. And so who's next? Uh, let's go with uh, Sister Renee. Yeah, sorry. I haven't had any argument that confirms that for me yet. And I might be a little biased because I was, you know, had a relationship with Buzz Aldrin and he told me about how the earth took his breath away when he came over the dark side of the moon and it looked like a blue marble. And I just don't see how that, I, I haven't heard an argument yet. And I've, I've really been open-minded with that simple physics, light refraction and basic understandings of how gravity works, pulling toward the center of mass and not just down, uh, Plus how massively large the earth is. You're not going to see a curvature uh, on something that large. So I just haven't seen anything scientifically that can't be refuted. And so I'm open to it, but I just still believe it's uh, a sphere. And I think God made the universe with physical laws and I glorify him for that. And I think the Bible can uh, represent either or. I think you could take it as he sits above the circle of the earth. Fine. Uh, that could also be looking at a three dimensional object uh, as a circle. Um, so I, I, as of now, I have not been convinced of it. Um, but I, I still think it's a, a sphere. Okay. So the, the question is uh, the earth is flat, not spherical, true or false. And, and you say true, the earth is flat. Um, yeah, and, and I guess it's okay to take just a, a very brief explanation. We'll go into I, I say it's round. I say it's a ball. Yeah, it's a I, ball. I'm not flat earth. Yeah, yeah. I'm not. Okay. Uh, all right. And uh, um, talking doctrine. Okay. Well, just real quick, just because there is a little confusion. Uh, Luke, are you saying, do you believe the earth is flat or a ball? Yeah, here, let me, maybe I didn't make structure the question very well. This is a true or false question. The earth is flat. True is my answer. And so you, you do not think it's a sphere? No, I, I, I gotcha. I didn't know. I think it, let me, since, since Renee took a moment to explain her position, I, I, I didn't take any time, but I'll just give you a brief answer. I, I, I was amazed uh, this last year when I, I discovered this was a topic for discussion and a lot of people had these uh, strong opinions about it. What really got me interested in it was uh, Jason Jack. Uh, he, he had some videos uh, uh, putting forth the, the uh, geocentricism and uh, I think, I'm not sure which is which, where the, the earth is the center of the universe rather than 
Uh, and then and the earth is flat. He, so he was present, presented that in his videos and we were talking about it and I, I respected him so much. I thought, I don't know anything about this, but taking the attitude that I've adopted with all theology and all these questions is that if I don't know both sides of the question, I'm going to study both sides and then make a decision. So I, I watched probably 50 videos on YouTube and I was surprised how many videos had a lot of really persuasive arguments supporting flat earth and geocentricism. There really are some sensible arguments and there's some scientific experiments that seem to support it too. But I haven't been won over to it. I'm still believing the earth is flat and not, not a ball. But uh, uh, that's been my experience uh, with it. It's, and it's, as I said, I tried to study both sides of it and make a conclusion. But I'm I'm not really so sure. But I, I'm I'm on the flat Earth side right now. Go ahead, uh, Matthias. See, that goes to show you uh, how much it's not important to us. Because I didn't even know you uh, uh, believed that. Um, and if if uh, Nori and Bill were here, Renee wouldn't be by herself. Uh, but no, I'm, I'm actually, I believe the Bible teaches a flat earth. Um, I've been a flat earther for close to four years, um, a little bit, you know, about a year or so before it blew up on the internet. And I was a geocentrist first because of Joshua. And then it, about six months later, um, I became a flat earther. Uh, but you know, it's, and I, 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 don't I, I need to I need to interrupt you or something. I, I think it's just because, uh, uh, as I told you, I'm kind of under the weather and uh, maybe I'm not even thinking very clearly. Did I did I just communicate to everybody that I hold to the flat Earth? Yes. Okay. I, yes. No, I don't. I I'm I, I do not hold to the flat Earth. So I am on I'm I am on Renee's side side of this. Uh, when you said that Renee was alone, that made me realize. Wait a second, I must have spoken incorrectly because because uh, I know that I've learned recently that that uh, both of you hold to the flat Earth, and uh, uh, that I didn't know that either. But um, um, I don't know why. I'm just a little bit confused. Maybe it's my medicine I'm on right now or something. But I said exactly the opposite of what I intended. I do not, the, the earth is flat is the question. And I say, false. I, every time I answer the question, I, I my mind is reversing it on me. I, I'm saying true when I mean it's false. Okay. Now, is it clear? <laughs> now, now, now I got you, but it does make, it, it does. Now you get why I was confused and asked you. Um, but yeah, the, uh, so cool. It's, uh, it's split down the aisle, but um, I'll let Daniel answer for himself. But yeah, I, uh, I've i been a flat earther for, for a while. But again, it's something that I don't bring up. Uh, the only time I bring up in um, uh, out in the world is when there's a, a very strong mocking atheist. And funny, ironically enough, uh, this subject has been able to stop <laughs> a, th a, cu a couple people right in their tracks, and one of them actually even got saved from it. So, um, personally, in my life, so uh, out, out of everything that I've read as well, um, this subject has really reached, you know, maybe not the normal people who are goody two shoes and uh, just rejecting you know coming to christ um but this has really gotten the, the the god haters who hated god with such a passion just last year and then because of this topic they totally did a complete 180 got in the word and uh, searched out found christ um Th this topic is really helping those types of people uh, a lot more. And then also, just not take up time, but the uh, the sad part about the issue, because I've watched the whole thing blow up and then uh, get the biggest 
head of steam now it's gone down a little bit but the the sad thing is is it's still growing every day and there's very few saints inside that arena and so the main thing is is that there's a whole bunch of new age people trying getting these people with the new christ consciousness getting them to believe that aliens seeded us and they're the ones who created us um and there's like hundreds of thousands of those and there's only like hundreds of us period saints so a lot of people are going into the flat earth and getting deceived uh by these new agers where if there were more saints in that arena uh it would help a lot of people get saved so um but daniel yeah i'll just say this true i believe that um every flat earther is one that has honestly tried to prove the globe to be true and I hate to say it, but it showed a lot in my own attitude of my own self-righteous pride. When I heard Matthias say something about it, the first thing I did was tell him he was retarded and he was dumb and stupid. But what I, I what caused me to seek it is I heard people making fun of the Bible and Bible literalists for saying the earth was flat. And I thought, wait a minute, I do believe in the, Genesis the literal six-day creation so I'm gonna honestly look at this without any bias or anything and say Lord where will this lead in my search I found there's two plausible explanations for about everything for either model they all work you know that pretty much it makes sense but everything that we see with our eyes Psalm 19 the heavens declare the glory of God the firmament showeth his handiwork you know it ultimately everything can be explained away so it brings you back to the Bible and the way that I understood what the Bible was saying after looking at it with an honest opinion or, or an honest mind saying well is this really what the Lord is saying a lot of things really made sense and um, so it's actually the Bible that changed my thinking on it it's a non-essential I think it's fun because you know, in some of the discussions, people get so irate. And all I do is ask them, how do they even calculate the curvature? They don't even know enough about their own view to be able to argue simple things. So it's like, that's when I'm like, okay, I think this conversation is over. You need to get a little bit more educated. And one thing that I've made sure I did not do is to tell people they're stupid, call people names, because there's a lot of that kind of stuff on the flatter side towards people that believe in the globe the same way. But um, so, I mean, it's an interesting topic. The Lord has used it to bring people to the Lord and to cause them to really think, you know, I, I really can trust God's word. So anyway, it's a non-essential. And um, but it's, it's an interesting topic nonetheless. All right. So um, except for the embarrassing time of me trying to answer the simple true or false question, <laughs> getting it all backwards, uh, I think it's clear that uh, um, Matthias and Daniel believe the earth is flat and Renee, and I believe that it's uh, a ball, not flat. Um, but I will say this, that, uh, um, when I found out Jason Jack believed it was flat, it caused me to pause and say, oh, I respect his, his intelligence and his education and, and integrity. And, uh, I think I owe it to him and myself to study it. So I studied it. And I think that's the attitude I'm hoping everybody will adopt with all of these questions we're bringing up today. Study both sides of everything. You know, then whatever side you decide is you're on, that's fine. No one's going to be mad about it, but at least be on it, intellectually honest. Okay. Um, uh, now, the next, um, I'm going to just let each person pick one. I, I could give you various uh, other um non-essential questions and topics, but I'm going to ask each person to choose one. Renee, do you have a non-essential question you can pose as a like true, true or false for us? I think one of the ones that people get super emotional about, I'd like to say too, one is that God's done with Israel. That's a big issue because there's a lot of so-called Christians that despise Israel, say God's done with her cast her aside, and therefore they read scripture out of context. And then the other one is the rapture. 
when it's going to happen before the tribulation, mid trib or post trib or do, as one of them, the rapture the do, one of them, do one of them at a time and pose it so we can say true or false. That way we can. Oh, know, okay. Uh, is the rapture uh, is the rapture before the tribulation or after? And I say, uh, uh, is the rapture before the tribulation? I'd say true because the tribulation is the time of Jacob's trouble. Not the time of the church's trouble, the time of Israel's trouble. So I'd say true. Okay, so that that could be, uh, maybe it could be considered pre-trib rapture, maybe even mid-trib or pre-wrath position. I don't know, uh, but you mm -hmm. don't think it's it's at the very end of time uh, when yeah. when everything, all hell breaks loose. <laughs> okay, uh, all right, uh, Matthias, your position on that. For the uh, for the rapture, I am very last day at the very last trump, the last twenty four hours of the six thousand year period. I believe time is before Jesus comes back, and I think the tares get taken out before the wheat. So I'm a very last day post tribber. So in the true or false format, I would say pre-trib, false. Okay. Did you want to okay. expand, uh, expand at all like the others or not? Not really. <laughs> okay. All right, then. Uh, uh, the pre-trib, uh, uh, the rapture is pre-tribulation, true or false. Uh, I would say false. Uh, I think uh, I'm probably pretty much lined up with Matthias's viewpoint on this. Uh, I did hold to a pre-trib rapture, a, um, a literal seven-year tribulation, uh, the return of the millennium, all, all these things that we, we've uh, learned uh, that are basically under the umbrella of um, dispensational futurism. That it was taught by Clarence Larkin, Peter Ruckman, Hal Lindsey, uh, it's, it's the popular view today. Uh, I held that position for 25 years and I, I learned it. I could teach it inside and out. And then the uh, same thing that happened is that when I, I feel an obligation that uh, I need to hear the other point of the other side of the story. And as I started studying uh, other viewpoints on this, uh, I was one over to the other side. And now I believe that the rapture uh, and the resurrection are not two separate events that are separated by a seven-year gap, but they, they are happening basically simultaneously. The rapture and the revelation is uh, a singular event at the end of, of history. Um, now, I, I think it, we could probably all say this. Uh, I don't know if Renee has a playlist or, or Matthias or not, but uh, I have playlists on most of these subjects. So if, if I take an hour or two hours or five hours or 10 hours to, to try to teach a position uh, on, a, on one of these subjects and, it's in, and it's, I have it there for you in a playlist, obviously I can't give you that much detail in a few minutes here now. So if you want to know more about my position, you'd have to go look at my playlist called uh, uh, dispensationalism, futurism, priorism, uh, millennialism. I think I have all those terms on the title, but find that and you'll see, uh, you know, how my opinion has ev evolved and the conclusion I came up with. But uh, I'm not really very convinced I'm right. This is, I, I'm probably, I lean very strongly. That's why I believe, but I, I don't, I don't have such great conviction that I say, I'm really sure about this one. Okay, Sister Renee. I just wanted to say I have gone back and forth on this. I am not, my feet are not grounded in this. It's just, I looked at all the verses where I was believing in post-trib and found that they were to the nation of Israel. So um, I'm, I'm honest. I will be honest and say, I don't know. Like I am not sure one way or the other. Um, I just know that Paul said that, this day shall not come till the man of sin be revealed. Um, so that's where I'm, I'm getting my view being swayed, but I have been back and forth 
between the two. And I will be the first to say I study both views and have gone back and forth on them. But now I'm where I am right now based on this is that it'll be that they're not the exact same event. That's all. I got you. So Renee is more of a post trib pre wrath. Um, but uh, uh, and not necessarily the traditional pre trib because a lot of the pre trib think that it's going to happen at any moment. They don't have to see the man of perdition uh, have come into play first. So um, it is a, it's a little, it's not like the traditional pre-trib, uh, but I did want to uh, answer a question. I think it's Jesus loves us all. Um, and uh, said, wouldn't it, if we believe in saved by grace through faith, and if you, uh, if you don't take the mark, wouldn't that be a work? Like if you're, if we're saved by grace without any works and then all of a sudden here we are the mark of the beast is there and so it would be a work to make sure that you don't take the mark and see that's what a lot of people uh, get confused on and I think that the simple answer is that it's not that it's a work to make sure you don't take the mark it's literally going to be impossible for a child of God to receive the mark so let's say that you can buy yourself, because we know they can't, and you have a weak Christian who just says, I know I'm going to heaven because I'm in, eternally secure, and even if I get that mark, I'm going to heaven because uh, what's his face, that uh, Calvinist is going around telling people that's true. That's false. Everybody who takes the mark is going to go to hell, period. But if a saint gets in that line, and they're going and they're ready to receive the mark. Well, God has what the, he calls a sin unto death. And what he's going to do is he's going to take the last breath of that thing before they're able to take that mark. And he's going to say, get your ass home, child. I, that's despicable. You had a chance to get your head cut off for me. I gave you the chance of martyrdom and you were going to go take that mark. Here, go to the least of the kingdom. And so it's not that it's going to be a work not to take it, it, it may be where you're going to line up in the heavenly hierarchy crown, but it, it's not a work because it's going to be impossible for a saint to even take the mark at that time because uh, God, God may even have a rule to those devils. You cannot give the mark to a saint. So they've got rules that they still have to follow and it's not going to be a work, even though I do believe we will be here. All right. Yeah. Uh, okay. okay, Renee, go ahead. Sorry, I just wanted to remark on that. First of all, it said it's not possible for the elect to be deceived. Not possible, like Matthias just said. Secondly, I'll just say thank you, Matthias, for having such faith in our God to get us and keep us saved. Thank you. I, I am it's always so much fear in this. And uh, thirdly, the Holy Spirit seals us till the day of redemption. See, God, uh, Satan's a counterfeiter. Holy Spirit sealed us in our spirit and Satan seals his people in the flesh. So I just want to say it's not possible as he just said. All right, well, I'm glad the chat room is listening and, and uh, participating. I also would encourage everybody in the chat room and for that matter, anybody who watched this as a video later to make a note of each of these questions write down your position and compare it to ours and everybody else you know. The whole point of this exercise, in my opinion, what I want to accomplish here is to demonstrate the variety of opinions that we all hold. And if that is the case, that you, you're going to have a hard time finding any other believer who will match your answers on all the non-essential topics, then you're going to have to just ask yourself, what am I going to do with these non-essentials when they disagree? Will I tolerate their opinion? Or will I be dogmatic and insist that they agree with me? Uh, and what you're really doing is you're elevating what we think is a non-essential topic. You're elevating it and making it essential. Um, okay. Um, the uh, Oh, uh, let me elaborate just a little bit more on this. I knew someone was going to talk about uh, eschatology and um, I, I, I probably have studied the book of Revelation more than any other book in the Bible. And that might surprise everybody. 
because I don't talk about it very much at all. And, uh, and I've studied it because I'm, I'm really want to understand it. But the more I've studied it, the more I become convinced that I do not understand it. And what I've done is I've gone, I've watched videos of, of uh, expert teachers who go ver uh, verse by verse teaching on the book of Revelation. They go one verse at a time and teach on it. And I, I've, I've seen a preterist teach on uh, the book of Revelation verse by verse. Uh, I've seen futurists do it. I've seen historicists do it. Um, and, and they're all experts. They're all scholarly. They're all intelligent and educated. And yet they, they have all these different ways that they take it. And it, I became more and more convinced that I, I could not have confidence because uh, all the, everybody had good arguments. And what I ended up believing in really is kind of, um, um, we know that preterism is the belief that all the prophecies were fulfilled by 70 AD, the time the temple was destroyed. And uh, that's full preterism. But what I believe is that Obviously, some some things were fulfilled before the temple, so that might be called partial or semi-preterism. I believe some things were fulfilled and applied to prior to 70 AD. I'm also a, a historicist in that I think that when we look at people like Hitler, Mussolini, Napoleon, and uh, America, and all these different things in the that happened throughout history since the Book of Revelation was written, that um, sometimes. And this was a popular view uh, at the time of the, the Reformation because they were arguing that all this is applying to the Pope in Rome. And uh, uh, so the historicist point of view is just that, that a lot of these prophecies throughout history, we see it all playing out through a historical timeline from uh, New Testament times to present time it's playing out and then the futurist viewpoint is no uh everything maybe i don't know if i can say everything but pretty much everything is future and not only future from the time it was uh, prior, uh, time it was written in 70 or 90 ad whatever you believe but it's uh it's a future even of today many of us believe that m much of the prophecy in the Bible today is still future to today. So I believe that some things did happen, as a preterist says, before 70 AD. Some things we see has played out throughout history, and some things are yet to come, like the second coming, the resurrection, the judgment, those things are all future. So I've basically kind of been uh, absorbed the teachings of all these different viewpoints, and uh, that, that's been my conclusion. But I don't try to teach it much, uh, talk about it much, because I don't have a lot of confidence that I'm right. Uh, okay, anything else on this before we go to another topic? Okay. Uh, next would be uh, Brother Matthias uh, pose a, another topic of a non-essential topic for us in the form of a true or false question, please. All right. Um... Let's see. Genesis 6 is talking about uh, the Sethite and Cain. What, what is it? Sethite, what? Cain? Seth and Cain view? No, how about um, Nephilim in the Bible are true? That would be easy. Or true or false, yeah. Nephilim are in the Bible. There you go. All right, you have to answer it first. True. Okay. True. And Brother Dan? I'm kind of on the fence on this one. I'm I'm not necessarily there, but uh, there's some things I'm not sure of that for it, so I'm on the fence. Sister Renee? Absolutely true. I've checked this out for 10 years. All the early church fathers understood it to be clearly the sons of God, the Benai Elohim, were uh, not human and therefore mating with human women, created giants, abominations that became our mythological 
gods like Hercules and Zeus and so forth. Uh, Josephus understood it. Only until 400 AD when the Catholic Church came around, they changed it. Said something about it was going to affect marriage or something. I don't know. It was just too supernatural for him to believe it. But uh, it's important when studying the Bible to, to read it through the lens of what they believed at the time. So not just Genesis 6, but Jude 6 and Peter. They all talk about it. Paul talks about women covering their hair not to tempt the angels. I mean, it, it's clear to me that it's absolutely true. And plus, there's lots of archaeological evidence for uh, supernatural beings that existed during that time. And I believe if you don't understand Genesis 6, you might look at God as a psychopath, a genocidal maniac that just wanted to kill people. But it said all flesh had been corrupted, had corrupted itself. And the word in, uh, in when it talks about Noah isn't just that he was a righteous man and he found grace in God's eyes. But it says he was shamim, which is the same thing as genetically pure in the Hebrew. So, yeah, I, I think it's clear that it's uh, absolutely true. All right. Thank you. OK, well, you, you seem very convinced and you also seem very knowledgeable on the subject. Um, I'm, I might be able to just yield to you because you, you study it so much. And I'm probably more like like Daniel in that I don't know if he's attempted to form a conclusion, but it's, it's kind of been a subject, maybe I've actually avoided it. Um, I've watched videos and heard people uh, teach on it for many years, and I found it interesting, but but also, I don't know why. I can't, honestly, I cannot tell you why. I purposely tried to just avoid the subject. So I don't really have a, a position one way or the other that I can support with, with anything. Uh, I, I have, I could give you an answer supporting each side in my own mind, but I, I'm, I'm totally unconvinced and don't, don't know enough about it. Uh, all right. Um, anything else on that subject before we go to that, another one? All right, then brother Daniel, can you pose a non-essential subject for us? Yeah. The, uh, the gap theory, that would be one I would say. So do you believe that before, uh, how, how would you pose the question as true or false? Bet there was a gap of millions of years possibly before Genesis 1 and Genesis uh, verse 1 and verse 2. Maybe that's the question. I say false. I say false too. So back to you guys. <laughs> okay, Sister Renee. I just, I, I can't see true or false on this. I, I'd have to say it's possible. Uh, for one, we don't know what a day was back then. It says the evening and the morning, but if the sun and the moon weren't in place, that there's no 24 hour period. Uh, and, you know, there is some evidence that maybe there was uh, Satan and his angels were on this earth prior. Jeremiah talks about another flood where the cities were destroyed and then in Genesis, God says, replenish the earth, not, not, you know, fill it, but replenish it. Like there was something here. I don't know. I'm just saying, I'm keeping my mind open on that. Uh, I can't say one way or the other. I've heard good arguments for both. Okay. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Very interesting subject. And uh, as I said, I, I studied from Clarence Larkin's book, Dispensational Truth, and a lot of Dr. Peter Ruckman's books. And uh, so I got indoctrinated to believing in this gap. Um, and yet um, I'm, I'm not really, I don't really feel like strongly one way or the other on that. I don't, um, I, it seems to make sense to me that it's a way, it's a, I believe it's a way of addressing the age of the universe and the age of the earth. Uh, and that brings us to maybe the next question. Uh, did everybody answer this question? They they did, but uh, but I do want to say that. Um, Before I just, go to that question, um, well, just to uh, to give a little bit of clarity for uh, for Renee on on a couple of the things, um, the replenish uh, actually in the in the sixteen eleven uh, actually meant to fill for the first time. So if you had a pitcher that's never been filled before you'd hand it to them and say, hey, replenish this. 
the language has changed, but if you look at the uh, um, Webster's Dictionary from 1828, uh, it'll show you that that is one of those words that have kind of flip-flopped on us since it was first written in the Bible. Um, and then my main problem with the gap theory myself is that it sort of leads to help to prop up uh, the pre-Adamic race. And the pre-Adamic race, I believe, is there to prop up the Luciferian doctrine that Jehovah God was a created being himself. Uh, so I know not everybody, like I, I know that, uh, Renee, you don't believe that at all, but I'm just saying that the pre-Adamic race actually does do prop up, you know, that De Lucifer and Jehovah were both created by Sophia. Sophia was a part of the force and she created incorrectly. So that, if anybody knows Luciferian doctrine, that that's just a little uh, glimpse of it. But then also the thing in Jeremiah where it talks about uh, the, the lay dead um, with nobody to bury them or lament them. They'll be dung on the ground. The whole earth will be that way. Um, I, I believe that that's actually the future. I believe that's actually talking about Revelation 19. Um, and it's a prophecy to come, not something that's happened in the past. Uh, because when uh, uh, the angel that stands in the sun, which is another flat earth verse, by the way. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. Uh, but the angel stands in the sun in Revelation and says, hey, birds, come over. There's about to be the great supper of the God, and you can eat the flesh of, you know, mighty men or horses. Uh, you'll eat the flesh of all men, it says, both free and bond. Um, and then it, right at the last verse of uh, Revelation 19, Jesus killed the remnant of them, which I believe the whole earth is there to battle against God at Armageddon. So the remnant of them is everybody. <laughs> and so that, that term in, in Jeremiah, I believe is a future thing uh, myself. Uh, so um, the, I don't have a problem with anybody believing the gap, but I would um, admonish uh, brethren to really look at the pre-Adamic race and how that helps prop up the new age stuff, you know, so, uh, but cool. That's interesting. I didn't know that you could draw a connection like you did. Um, okay, uh, anything else before we go to the next question? All right. Um, okay, here's the burning question. <laughs> will, will God um, cause or allow the lost to be tortured in fire for, for all eternity. True or false? Um, I say false because I believe uh, the lake of fire and the second death means that they are consumed when they go in it, <clears throat> that they do not live in it and, and uh, forever and ever. Uh, I, I don't think, I have a, a playlist by the way that's quite lengthy discussing all this that entitled what is the state of the dead if you want to know a lot more about my conclusion on this but basically i believe that it's the fire is consumes and people perish they no longer exist um I, the um the view that people are burned and they're tortured and tormented either because god is causing it or allowing it for all eternity uh, it doesn't it doesn't go with my view of our god who god is um his character and nature uh, but you know again i could talk for two or three hours about it so that's my short short answer to that uh false uh, the, there is no eternal torment uh in in a fiery hell people being tortured forever uh sister renee <coughs> Sorry, <coughs> I am. Uh, I am leaning toward uh, perishing, and here's why. There's some scripture that talks about God creating a fire inside of Satan, him becoming ash, 
and him being a horror to all men, that he is nothing. He, he's just made nothing. Also, it wouldn't make sense to put the angels in Tartarus and then just move them to another prison. I mean, it, I, I, but here's the main reason. Um, it says that death and hell are cast into the lake of fire. Now, if death is destroyed, how can death continue to keep people in a death state in eternal torment if death is completely destroyed? So there's only one verse that I think you could possibly take is that they're permanently there, uh, suffering conscious, the smoke of their torment, right? They have no rest day or night. Uh, well, it talks about Sodom being destroyed by eternal fire. It's obvious that Sodom's not still burning, that the fire came from an eternal source. So I'm, I, I don't discount it. Uh, that uh, conscious torment. I just, I'm really leaning and I've really studied this a lot. I took every single verse about the dead minus the Raphaim verses, like dead things are formed under the water. That's not talking about human beings. That's talking about the giants, the Raphaim. Um, but anything that talked about uh, hell, death, Sheol, the grave, lake of fire. And I studied it and I could find one verse that maybe uh, implies that and then there's the story of jesus talking about in luke when he talks about uh um uh, the rich man and lazarus uh again that was during the time of sheol when there was abraham's bosom and then the place of torment but i i i just can't know you know but if death is swallowed up in victory and death and hell are cast into the lake of fire how can any of it continue to go on and exist if it's destroyed so there, there's my issue with that. I cannot say for certain, but I'm leaning toward what uh, Brother Luke is saying because I don't see anywhere where human beings have inherent more immortality. Like Adam and Eve had to eat from the tree of life. We have to eat from the tree of life, Jesus Christ, in order to have immortality. So, uh, you know, I don't think it's inherent in human beings, um, but that's where I'm leaning to. I won't discount it me being wrong, but that's where I'm leaning. All right. Thank you. Matthias. Um, so, I mean, if, if it is eternal torment for the lost and that's what God finds just hey, his ways are not my own and let, let him be just and I'll love him just the same. But I'm with Brother Luke on it doesn't seem or sound like that is what I read in Scripture. Especially since, you know, uh, it tells us that, that his wrath will not endure forever. And it does quite often, especially in one psalm, over and over and over and over, it tells us that his mercy will endure forever. And so, as Renee was just saying... We are, nobody is born, nobody is naturally immortal. Only God is naturally immortal. And so we have to put off our immortality or our mortality and put on, I just said that backwards. Nobody's immortal. Uh, God is only immortal. So we have to put off our mortality and put on immortality through Jesus Christ. And so in hell, I do believe that there is conscious torment in hell. But I do believe hell is in the belly of the earth, and that's a place that the lost are going, and they're waiting for their judgment. There's actually a time when hell is going to, uh, the people in hell are going to resurrect out of it. It's called the resurrection of the unjust. Uh, and then there's Gog and Magog. Uh, but then there's the great white throne judgment, and when I believe when they get thrown into the lake of fire, that they will go to their second death. I believe they'll be put out, destroyed. Um, the wages of sin is death. You know, so um, I believe that uh, the same way that when your body dies and uh, uh, it ceases to uh, exist, so to speak, I mean, it's going to rot away for a while. My body dies. There's, there's nothing there. There's no conscience in the body. 
And Jesus said, you know, don't fear him that can kill your body, but fear him who kills your body and your soul. So the first death is the flesh. The second death is the soul. The spirit's God. So everybody's spirit, even the lost, is going to go back to him who gave it uh, when they die. But um, so I do believe that there's going to be torment in hell for a long time. I mean, at least a thousand years. You know, you got your from your 6,000 years to your 7,000 years. So there's uh, at least a thousand years there. And everybody who's been in there longer is going to be in there even longer. Um, and then when they get to the great white throne uh, judgment, I believe God's going to show him every time that he reached out to him. So he's going to reveal to him all the time the children of God were talking to them and trying to preach them the God. God's going to show that. A saint in it, it was actually going to be revealed that. And everyone's going to know how many times God himself was reaching out to them in their lifetime. Then he's going to throw them in the lake of fire. And I believe that they will be destroyed uh, and put out. Now, um, I agreed with everything that Renee just said. Uh, I The verse about uh, Satan burning and becoming nothing and looking at him, um, I, I don't. I don't know that verse perhaps uh, offhand myself. I know there, there's a verse that uh, I think it's in Isaiah that everyone will look at him while he's in hell and be like, is this the man who did the things? And like literally call him a man. Um, but I do think that the beast, the false prophet and Satan himself are going to burn forever in hell. I believe that they get thrown in alive. I believe that the eternal torment is that we see is uh, is talking about those three specifically. In fact, the beast, the Antichrist, and the false prophet get thrown into the lake of fire before the thousand years. Satan gets put into the pit and bound for a thousand years. Then after the thousand years, Satan is loose. And the rest of the dead live again, if you read Revelation chapter 20, verse 5. So um, the uh, then after that, Satan's the next, the first one to get thrown in the lake of fire. So the first three they get thrown in, the beast, the false prophet, and then Satan, they get thrown in and they get thrown in alive, the Bible says. But everyone else gets thrown in to their second death. So I do think that's the difference. Um, uh, but I can't remember at this point what the the true or false oh, yeah, way false. is. So I would say true. Okay, then I would say true. Um, I believe what the scripture says and the way that I interpret it. You know, it is you know eternal punishment, and you know at the same hand you could argue, well, God's not willing that any should perish, so then nobody's going to perish. But we know that's not true. I don't believe it's God's will that anybody goes to the lake of fire uh, for eternity. But the reason people go there is not because of sin, because sin has been paid for. I saw a few comments. So I just wanted to make the comment, God's not going to do je double jeopardy on sin. If Jesus paid for sin, like the Bible says he did, then we can't pay for it. So according to Hebrews 10, what we see, the, the sore punishment than being dead you know, by the law, under the law, is to reject Christ. So John 3, 19 tells people they're condemned already because they have sinned. No, it says because they've not believed on the name of the only begotten Son of God. So uh, as hey, I would love to believe, I mean, I would love it to be such as that it's not eternal torment. I really would, but, you know, I, I just don't see that in the scriptures at this time. Now, I'm not saying I can't change, but I'm going to preach the gospel to people as if they, they could burn for eternity in the lake of fire. I want them to respond to the gospel. So that's my stance on it. Well, um, and then actually I want to respond to that just real quick because, uh, one of the things I don't ever bring up my view on hell ever, uh, whatever, or the lake of fire, I should right. say. 
Um, because whenever I preach, I just tell them, hey, if you don't believe, you're going to burn in hell. Because I believe that. And in fact, I think uh, I think it's, it's very true. Um, the ceasing to exist part, the only time I actually use that in a soul winning effort um, is when somebody comes to me and says, I would never believe on a God who would keep me eternally tormented just because I didn't believe him. And so I get that often, like going door knocking, you, that is a common thing that you get. And so, you know, if you don't believe in um, uh, this doctrine, annihilationism, destructionism, whatever you want to call it, um, conditional immortality is what I like to call it, uh, that there is a condition to immortality, and that's believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, but if you don't believe that, you can't really use this. But if you if you do see it in scripture, then you can tell them, hey, that's not what I see in scripture. In fact, what I see in scripture is that God's going to put you in a place of torment for quite a long time. And then actually, I see that he's going to give you one last uh, outreach of mercy when he puts you out and you become nothing, just like what you're hoping for. You know, so I don't know if I'm absolutely correct but if you die in unbelief and go to hell you better hope that i am and then also whenever i sit there and tell them that i don't think that god's going to do that eternally he's going to give them one last thing of mercy it i can i can say one time it didn't work they were still just as mocking and scoffing as ever but the many other times it just stops them dead in their track their mouth just drops open and their guard is put down. Like you have the ability to then preach them the gospel, the simple truth of believing on Jesus Christ, that they wouldn't have heard it any other way because they're not going to believe in a God who's going to eternally torment. But when you say, hey, the Bible doesn't say that, that's the only thing they've been digging their heels into. And that's the thing that they've been using to just break off everything. And if you can just show them in love uh, the viewpoint that, uh, that I'm aligning to, uh, it works really well. And I'm not saying that you should try to find our viewpoint because we get that 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 tool. I'm just trying to say that the only time I ever use my view uh, is when we're sharpening swords and talking about it, or when one of those people say I, that they would never worship a God like that. I do use it in a soul winning effort. Other than that, I mean. If you go through and look at the talk and doctrine, you can look at, uh, I mean, I got to look at how many hours, but there's thousands of hours of recording. Um, you're not going to hear me talk about hell not being eternal, except for maybe the one broadcast we had directed on it and a collection of maybe 10 minutes. <laughs> so it's not a topic that any of us who do believe it uh, actually even talk about so to cause any discord or strife over non-essentials and especially this one it's kind of ridiculous all right okay sister renee and, and then I'll, I'll i'll take the last word so we can go on uh to another topic I'm losing my voice i'm losing my voice and the fever's coming back so i'm gonna have to split i'm so sorry okay sister okay. everybody please keep praying for sister renee okay and i thank, thank you for uh spending this much time with us. I right, love Blessings. you guys. Love you too. Bye. We'll be praying for you. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I will say that uh, I, I've had the same kind of experience uh, in terms of uh, witnessing the people that you just described, Brother Matthias, uh, that um, one of the things that is um, a stumbling block for a lot of people is the idea that uh, I could never believe in a God that could be so cruel to torture people forever and ever and ever and ever. And uh, so in that way, for those people to be able to show them in the Bible that no, they perish, they're destroyed, they're consumed, they just don't exist anymore, uh, that that is a, a an aid. But I, I, I definitely, of course, would never... I would never resorted to that when I believed in eternal torment. 
I, I, I taught and defended eternal torment for 25 years. Um, uh, I, I led a, a friend, friend to the Lord years ago, Tony, and he, he attended my home Bible study and my home church for seven years. And, and uh, he one day introduced this idea into our group. And uh, a lot of people, they, they couldn't cope with it. And, 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 and Tony was, you know, he was kind of like, uh, I don't want to say overwhelmed, but he was like under attack from everybody. And even though I disagree with him, I thought, no, let's, it, it's, it, there's no reason to kick him out of our group or anything over this. And, but he was very doggedly persistent with me and, and, and uh, kind of forced me to study it. And after I studied it, uh, I was won over to, to the other side. But when it comes to witnessing, I've heard some people, even in recent comments I've seen on videos, people will say, well, uh, Brother, Brother Luke teaches that there's no eternal torment in hell, so why would anybody want to be saved, you know, if they're just going to perish? Uh, I think that's a, a, a really a silly argument. And I'm using silly to be polite, uh, because uh, you know, if a person was uh, honestly, at least if a person is really honest, I'm not talking about just a, an argument you get in someone where it's not really even an honest intellectual debate. They're just trying to win an argument. You know, they're not really seeking the truth. But if they're really seeking the truth and they're given the choice of, OK, when you die, you will suffer the second death in the lake of fire. There you'll perish and you'll no longer exist. Or you can have eternal life and bliss for joy forever in the new heavens and new earth, and the joy will be on anything you can imagine forever and ever. Now, which, which do you want? The contrast is great. We don't, we don't need the threat of torture forever and ever, turning our God into a, um, a cruel tyrant uh, that actually causes a lot of people to reject Christianity because they cannot embrace a, a God of that kind. So some people think that eternal torment aids in leading people to Christ because, because they're scared to death of being tortured. And then uh, Matthias and I think, well, actually, I think it helps to tell them God won't be torturing anybody uh, like that forever and ever. Uh, God is just, so they, they die. There is a lake of fire. There is a second death, and they, that's where they perish. Um, so that's been my experience with it. But I, I would advise everybody to do what I did. Uh, I, even though I defended eternal torment for 25 years, when I was confronted with it and had to discuss it with one of my uh, friends, and, uh, I was forced to learn. And as I studied it, uh, there's a, one particular site called uh, Rethinking Hell. Rethinking Hell, and then my playlist on my channel, if you watch those videos, uh, the worst thing that's going to happen is you're going to learn the other side of the argument. Maybe you won't change your mind, but it can't hurt. It's not going to kill you to learn the other side of the argument. And you'll actually be amazed because there's many, many, many verses that we can use to support conditional immortality and uh, the, uh, that we are perish uh, rather than continue to live in this uh, fire. Uh, there's many verses that support that. There's only a handful of verses that could be used to support eternal torment. And there are some good explanations for those verses. So whatever you decide, the main thing is, I just hope you'll be intellectually honest and, and study both sides. I found that those people who have taken the time, and I get a lot of PMs, and some people post it publicly on some of my videos, but many people are afraid to say it publicly because they know the backlash they're going to suffer. But those people who actually take the time to study the other side of it, uh, from my experience, they're either all or most of them switch their point of view on this. Uh, okay, um, anything else before we go to another uh, non-essential? Okay, uh, all right, so let's... Uh, whose turn is it now? I, I took that last one, so I got, it's Renee's turn. She's not here, so uh, Matthias, can you pose another okay. non-essential question for us? All right, all right. Um, uh, let's see. Here's one I get in argument. Well, let's throw let's throw uh, a loop in there. Um, 
everybody was created in the first six days. You, me, Adam and Eve, and everybody in the future. Everybody was created in the first six days. True or false? I say true. I believe true. Uh, I believe that Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 are consecutive and not concurrent. I believe that uh, uh, created, made, and different things. Everything that created and made was in, done in the first six states and then he it. And then he forms us at different times. I was formed in my mother's womb about 39 years ago. You know, uh, but I was and those are two different things, but I was both of them in the first six days. So uh, I guess the uh, the question is, uh, uh, was everybody created in the first six days or every, every human was created in the first six days, true or false? Daniel. I'll say uh, true. I, I agree. I, um, I heard what Matthias said about it and I looked in the scriptures. And it seems to be that because, you know, uh, the Bible talks about Melchizedek meeting um, Levi while he was in the loins of his father, Abraham. So, you know, could be, you know, he created all. And then when the time comes, they're formed in the womb. So, yeah, it, it makes sense. So I say true. And I would say just real quick that if he isn't, then if it's not true, then he is still creating. But yeah, go ahead, Luke. Yeah, what was that last statement? If it's not true, then he is still what? Creating. Creating? Oh, okay. <laughs> creating. Yeah. I, I see what you're okay. Well, I got I got to hand it to you, brother. Uh, this is a brand new question that I've never heard before. It's uh, really interesting. Um, uh, I if you have any videos on this, uh, so I can understand it better, uh, I'd like to watch them and, and so I better understand what you're you're saying. But um, it's it seems to me you're uh, you're, you're saying that um, we, we're all created at least spiritually. I'm, I'm assuming spiritually because we we don't have a body until we're born from our mother's womb. So maybe we exist. We are created and we exist in some form, uh, not in not a complete three uh, triune being like body, soul, and spirit. Uh, but we we exist maybe what soul or soul instead, and then we get a body at our birth. Uh, if that's what you're saying. Um, but I, I'd have to learn more about it. I, I don't. I don't know what to say about. It. I've never heard it posed before. So I, I look forward. To, if you have any more any videos to give me, I'd like to like to hear more about that. Right. Um, you know, I really don't have too many videos on it. I've only talked about it maybe on a broadcast or two because um, it is. It's one of those non-essentials. It's one of the things that I saw in scripture the first time that that I read it. Um, but uh yeah basically um god was omnipotence so knew every time adam and eve would know each other and he picked each one of the times that he wanted to create a being uh, uh, uh one of the sons or daughters and said at this moment this is when i'm going to create uh seth and he did that for everybody on the same day, day six. And he picked, so he knew that your parents were going to get together and every time they were going to get together, not that he chose, but he knew through omnipotence and omnipresence when that was. And so he said, on this day, I'm going to create brother Luke. Uh, I'm going to create brother Luke from this. And then he takes the genes and he turns off and on. He knows the hair that he wants you to have. He want, he had, he created you exactly how he wanted you. And he did it through his biological system. He is the one who turns the whatever's recess, recessive or dominant on. And he knew what he was doing from the foundation of he did everybody on this day. And so you have everybody in all of creation here created. And then he had to make everybody made that he put me and all of my siblings into my father's loins 
all of my uncles and aunts into my grandfather's loins, all of my great uncles and aunts into my great father's loins, to where at a point we were literally all in Adam's loins. Everybody was in Adam's loin except for Eve when he ate from the fruit. So we were literally all there in the loins of Adam. And so, yes, it is the spirit we have is given to us from God. And that's at, you know, he just gives it at birth um, that drives, but it's the soul and what he, how he was going to from even. He knew all that from before, but it's the soul that's in the loins, um, like in a little shell, so to speak, uh, just waiting to, to grow a seed. <laughs> And uh, so we are in our father's loins until the moment of conception, which God knew and he had created way back then when that moment was going to be. And then he forms in the womb. So he, he does that. Um, uh, he does that uh, himself with his hands. Now, here's one thing that is actually a little controversy about controversial about that. So when was Adam formed? I would say day eight. I'd say when you read Genesis one and it's talking about uh, uh, created male and female, created he them, that's all male and female. When it says that he gives dominion and this and that, everything that everybody thinks that's Adam and Eve, he gave it to, but I believe he, it's all humanity he was given it to. And then he rested on the seventh day. Then, See, a lot of people think Genesis 2 is just a recap of Genesis 1, but it's not. It's not, uh, it's, it's not concurrent. It's consecutive. And so after he rests, you read that uh, then he forms Adam out of the dust of the, of the ground. So, um, now I've, got, I've got it pulled up here in verse 4. This is the verse that he was talking about. Genesis 2, 4 says, these are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, which that was day one. So that caused me to think a little bit on that, but I'm not real sure. I mean, it's, it's definitely an interesting topic. Right. Well, it's, um, I find it very interesting, especially because, uh, with 31 years of studying the Bible and, and discussing it, uh, that uh, no one's ever posed this kind of question to, that I'm aware of. So I find it very interesting. Uh, the uh, The idea of uh, these accounts being consecutive or, or uh, a, a broad explanation than a more detailed explanation of the same thing, I think is, is, is a way of expressing it. Um, uh, that's kind of the standard answer that I've always given that most people I know use. So to, to say that, no, it's consecutive is, is a new idea. Uh, I, I'd like to hear more about that too. Right. Um, yeah. It's a, uh, um, it is more, uh, it's not just, uh, um, not only were the days different, like, yeah, we'll, we can go over it, but the part of creation, like we can go through day one, day two, day three, like they're mixed up. He created different things at different times and everything he created in chapter two, he did out of the ground and everything he did in chapter one, he spoke into existence. Um, so no, I, I get, I get what you're saying. Uh, and to address in the chat room, it's not Mormonism uh, because Mormonism say that they're, all spirit babies up in in heaven waiting to come down here uh, it's not mormonism at all but i do get that mormonism tries to snatch on to truth sort of like the uh, catholics are grabbing on to the trinity you know like they've got to have truth within their religion otherwise nobody's ever going to believe it and especially when you get these off doctrine things that you know that just ring true to people uh if it were true so the um the, the thing is, is, uh, yeah, there's no choice before you get here. So it's not Mormonism at all. It's not that we're sent here. It's not uh, racist at all as Mormonism takes their view. Uh, it's literally that God did all the creating on this um, it, within the first six days. 
And if he didn't, it, again, remember this, if he did not do all the creating in the first six days, then that means he's still creating today. And I think that goes against Bible. I think when God rested, it was done. He said everything to work out in a system, the seed within itself. So I don't think he ever created anything else after uh, day six. So if anybody does have something on me or something for me to look at in scripture for that, please send it. Cause I've actually, when I was studying the topic out, I was looking for it. So, but yeah, this is another non-essential, but uh, that's why I said throw you for a loop. Cause I didn't, I thought maybe you might not have ever heard it. Yeah. Uh, well, you, you don't throw me for a loop because I, I don't have emotional knee jerk reactions the way that uh, my the old man wants me to behave. And this is the problem, the root of really the problem uh, that I see in, in the church, uh, and the lack of tolerance for different opinions on non-essentials. Well, first of all, some of these people are elevating the all these topics to essentials, saying this is so important that if you disagree with me, then uh, you know uh, you're, a, you're a heretic, you're probably not even saved and I can't fellowship with you at all. And I'm just going to make videos and call you names. Uh, that's the problem is that they're elevating non-essentials to making them essentials. Uh, but it, it, it's rooted in the idea of uh, that they hear something and it's foreign and, oh, it sounds a little like some Mormon idea. And all of a sudden you, you're branded and, and re they react where they just want to pummel you and, and, uh, uh, they, instead of having the attitude that I think is a sign of maturity, I think it really boils down to a, a mature Christian is not going to have these emotional knee jerk reactions. Like I remember when Tony first introduced uh, uh, annihilationism into our church and uh, nobody agreed with him, but Frank, who was my street preaching partner, uh, when Tony was trying to explain to us, you know how people start uh, their knee. Their knee goes, oh, I can't even show you. I don't, you know, it's a knee jerk reaction. He literally had knee jerk reaction. His knee started jumping up and down like in, a, in like a tremor, and, and uh, he, he physically was reacting. His body could not stand what he was hearing. Some people actually go like that. I've had people go like that to me too. They cannot stand to hear it um so that's that's the problem is that if people would uh if they're mature and I'm, some people will say well that's luke you're very condescending aren't you you're arrogant uh, i've been called that before too but i think this boils down to a mature christian is going to be fair to the other the, the brethren listen to, and hear them out give them a fair hearing and not have these emotional knee-jerk reactions and then go on a crusade to try to destroy them because they disagree with someone on a on a minor doctrine everything we've talked about today are, are minor they don't they don't rise to the level of importance of the deity of christ or that salvation's a, a, a free gift uh offered to everybody by faith in jesus it's not a, a reward you earn through your own efforts and eternal security those those three uh, are, are so essential that's why we've come to an agreement uh, i've been saying it for several years i was happy to learn that you're satisfied you think that these three core doctrines that's enough to base our fellowship on that's enough to hold us together and uh, maybe someday we'll discover some topic we say hey maybe we need to add a fourth because this is really that important but i don't i can't find any others that are so important that we have to say uh this if you don't agree uh is uh you're not a not a christian and you can't be in the fellowship all the other questions that we're bringing up today uh, are they they just not that important i i want to get it right and like eternal torment, if, if I really believe that the Bible uh, taught me that eternal torment was correct, I'm not going to resist God and, and go against him. Uh, but uh, after I studied it, the other side of it, I became convinced that, no, the Bible doesn't teach it at all. It, it's, it says the opposite. 
So I'm going to go with what the Bible says. And um, but I really enjoy hearing about different opinions. And this is this is something I think is lacking. It's a joy to me to talk to someone who disagrees with me on any of these non-essentials. Uh, there's several things today that came up that I, well, after all these years, I've never heard that one before. That doesn't offend me. That interests me. I want to learn learn more about it. And uh, for, for and if someone says, Brother Luke, you're absolutely wrong on this, and and uh, I I'm 180 degrees uh, different than you on this. Okay, tell me in more. And and because if I'm wrong, if you're right, and and I'm wrong, I don't want to remain wrong. <laughs> I'll listen. I've changed my mind on a few things over the years. I'm willing to listen. Um, okay, I guess there's there's other th subjects that we could uh, add to this list as non-essentials, but at least I hopefully we made the point that if you bring up enough topics and ask everybody to take a stand on it, that's true. That's false. That's true. That's true. And then you compare notes. The 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 conclusion will be. None of us agree with any other person completely. So now the question is, how will you deal with it? Will you resort to saying, you're a false teacher, they're a heretic, uh, and I'm going to expose them? <laughs> or, or will you say, it's not an essential, I'd like to learn more about their point of view, and I think they're wrong, maybe in a, in a respectful dialogue, I can convince them that they're wrong but at least be willing to hear them out too. All right, uh, I kind of summed up uh, my thoughts here. Why don't you, each of you, sum up your thoughts on the, the talk today, and then uh, which of you would like to do a, a gospel a message at the end? Did you hear me? Are you, are you still there or frozen? Huh. Okay, I, I see that their uh, their picture on my is uh, still. So I don't know if they've lost. Uh, hmm. uh, okay, um, we're getting close to the time to give the gospel message. And uh, is there any way that you can? Is it possible to send me a comment here so that I know if you're going to be able to? Uh, continue or not, or if I need to finish this up myself. All right, I guess because we have dead air now, um, and there's, uh, I don't, I'm kind of at a loss. I'm not knowing if Matthias and Daniel are gonna be able to um, get audio back again. Okay, they left. So I'm thinking that they're gonna probably hit the link again, get back on and problem will be solved. But in the meantime, I'll, I'll stall uh, in just a minute. So let me sum this up today, okay? We had the question, is the earth flat? And uh, Renee said, no, it's a ball. Brother Luke said, no, it's not flat, it's a ball. Uh, Brother Matthias and Brother Daniel said, yes, the earth is flat. Uh, I can speak for Brother Bill, I know his position. He says the earth is a ball. I can speak for Brother Jason Jack. Uh, he, he believes the earth is flat. So you can see there are varying opinions. Um, is the rapture pre-trib? Um, and uh, uh, I, Sister Renee thinks that it's uh, pre, probably mid-trib, I think, if I'm, I don't want to misrepresent, but you can go back and listen. Uh, mid-trib rather than pre-trib, but it's, it's before the, the wrath, at least. Do you think, she thinks that the church will be spared the wrath. And uh, 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 Brother Matthias and I both think that uh, the, the, uh, the rapture um, will happen at the end of time. I believe that the rapture and the resurrection is a, a singular event rather than two separate events that are spaced by a seven-year period called the tribulation. Um, I don't remember Brother Daniel's position on, on that. The Nephilim... Uh, uh, Brother Daniel and Brother Matthias both uh, believe in the Nephilim account rather than the Seth account, uh, I think. 
Now, I know the Sister Renee believes in the Nephilim account. Uh, for me, I don't know. I don't. I just haven't studied enough to, to have an opinion. The gap in creation, uh, rather than, in other words, was the universe created, and then there was some kind of activity and creation going on in the earth, and the, and before the the account that we get in uh, Genesis one, um, uh, that's called that's the gap uh, theory, and uh, Brother Daniel and Matthias. Uh, neither of them hold to the gap. Uh, I grew up kind of in the church thinking that the gap was correct, but I, I don't I don't really know. It also relates to how old we, we think the earth is. Uh, Sister Renee, I think she uh, does, uh, does, does hold to the gap uh, in creation. And then eternal torment, uh, Brother Daniel uh, is still holding to the, uh, uh, the idea that the lost will suffer eternal torment forever and ever and that uh sister renee is leaning towards that they they are annihilated uh i believe that the lost are annihilated they perish they go into the lake of fire and they're consumed they no longer exist uh, brother uh, matthias believe that they are annihilated that they perish in the lake of fire but he believes that they're waiting in, in hell uh, until the, the, the great white throne judgment at the end of time before before that happens. Um, so I guess that's uh, uh, that's that's it. Um, the gospel message, uh, I'll, I'll keep it real, real short. Um, Jesus offers everybody eternal life as a free gift. Uh, if you've never if you're not familiar with this idea and you, you hear this, you, you'd probably be shocked because the idea may be foreign to you because all the religions of the world have been teaching us for thousands of years that to go to paradise or heaven or have this wonderful afterlife, uh, God will judge us and it'll be based upon how good we are, based upon personal merit. But the Bible and Christianity uh, disagrees with that. And, and, and it, uh, Christianity says that uh, if we go to heaven, it is not determined by our, our behavior. Uh, it's, deter it's determined by our faith in Jesus. Um, so in other words, heaven and eternal life is a free gift offered to everyone. And we receive the free gift from Jesus when we put our faith completely in the person and finished work of Jesus. We believe that he's our God, he's our savior. He paid for our sins. He raised himself from the dead to prove to us that he does have power over life and death. And uh, so we receive the gift of eternal life because of our faith in Jesus. Uh, but the world believes that no, heaven is earned as a reward. Heaven is a reward for good behavior. Uh, so that's the difference between biblical Christianity and what most people think Christianity is and what most religions of the world are, are teaching. Uh, so it's really, really very simple. Uh, I'm asking you now to repent. And that simply means change your mind. If you believe that you can work your way to heaven by being religious, by giving money to charity, by getting sin out of your life, then you're, you're not going to go to heaven. You will instead go to hell or the, 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 the lake of fire. You will suffer the second death in the lake of fire uh, instead. Uh, you need to reject the idea that you can earn your salvation and embrace the idea that it's offered as a gift from Jesus and Jesus alone is the source of this gift of eternal life. When you come to that conclusion, when you're convinced and you believe in Jesus for your salvation, then the Holy Spirit of God enters you and lives in you forever and ever. And then the Holy Spirit will, will work on you and start changing your desires and attitudes and interests and even your activities. Uh, it's a wonderful thing to have the Holy Spirit of God help uh, direct your life and change us. Um, so that's, that's it. Uh, put your faith in Jesus, reject uh, all the religions of the world, and instead rely on Jesus instead. If you decide to do that today, if you put your faith in Jesus, uh, then make a comment and, and let us know. We'd love to celebrate. 
because that's why we're here to share this good news with you. And uh, when we find out that someone hears the good news, they embrace it and believe it, and they receive the gift, it's a it's a reason to celebrate. So thank you for joining us this Sunday and join us next Sunday uh, and this whole week. Go to the the church website. Uh, and uh, you can have fellowship there. All kinds of fellowship activities uh, are available to us all there. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus.